This is Duke University. Conversations have been wonderful, and I'm really grateful you're here. I'm going to introduce the speakers, the panelists, from my far left to my nearer left. And yes, that does signify. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> left is the operative word. Um, <laughs> Professor Brittany Cooper is a 2009 alumna of the Graduate Institute of Liberal Studies at Emory. She has a PhD in American Studies and also HBCU grad from Howard with a bachelor's degree in English and political science. Um, Professor Cooper is a scholar of black women's intellectual history, black feminist thought, and race and gender. She's also co-founder of what we all know now as the Crunk Feminist Collective, which is a feminist of color scholar activist group. Um, Next, Jessica Marie Johnson is an assistant professor of history at Michigan State University, holds a PhD and MA from University of Maryland College Park, and a BA in African and African American Studies from WashU in St. Louis. So for anyone who asks, what can you do with a degree in AFAM Studies, you can be on a panel like this. <laughs> <laughs> also want to say she was a Mellon Mays Fellow. Um, <laughs> Her research interests include women, gender, and sexuality in the African diaspora, histories of slavery and the slave trade, and she is a digital humanist who founded the African Diaspora PhD blog. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what you can do with digital humanities. <laughs> Martha Jones is a member of the law school's faculty and associate professor of history and chair of University of Michigan's Department of Afro-American and African Studies. She's co-director of the Michigan Law Program in Race, Law, and History. Her PhD is from Columbia and a JD from CUNY School of Law. And prior to joining Michigan's faculty, she was a public interest <coughs> litigator for the HIV Project and Legal Services. Her work there focused on the rights of people with disabilities. Um, she's been recognized and supported by ACLS, the a visitor at the National Humanities Center, so she knows it's better to be here in the winter than in Michigan. <laughs> um, she was a Friday fellow there. Blair Kelly is our neighbor and PhD come back. She's Associate Professor of History of North Carolina State University and now Assistant Dean of Interdisciplinary Studies and International Programs. So you can be a dean and still talk about <laughs> scandal. <laughs> <laughs> She's the author of the award-winning yes. Right to Ride, Street yes. Car Boycotts and African American mm -hmm. Citizenship. Um, which just keeps racking up awards. She received her BA from the University of Virginia in History and AFAM Studies, and her MA and PhD from Duke University. Um, so I am just delighted to welcome all of these scholars to this panel. You can probably hear that there is a thread of law um, woven through this, although I, from this morning's panel, I kind of doubt we'll stay strictly within those <laughs> guidelines. But there was a guideline, which is really interesting, of the Equal Protection Clause. And the title of the panel, um, The Illegality of Black Ill, you know, the way we do it with the parentheses, um, <laughs> Legality of Black Womanhood. And then in case you didn't get that part, you got to testify because the booty don't lie. <laughs> so, you know, we're speaking to multiple constituencies here. But the framework was the Equal Protection Clause and the context of intersectionality in the work of black womanhood. And since we have Shonda Lang giving us these multiple and complex visions of black women, one of the things I thought I'd start out as a general question is what do we have to say about Shonda Land and the legal construction, um, both in terms of framing the black body and I would suggest the outlaw um, fugitive aspects of black womanhood. I'm going to start with Brittany and we'll just start with that general question and then go with the flow. Cool. No, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, so I've been working with um, this construct of <coughs> what would happen if we thought of the universe of Shond Shondaland as being like the dystopic universe she creates on Scandal, which is called Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and so um, I, so a few things. One is we're treated, and I'm and I primarily an aficionado of Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder. I don't really do the medical dramas too tough, um, but there's a there's a way that we're asked to engage with notions of black womanhood in relationship to state power structures um, when we think about both Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder. And so 
Part of this invites us into a question about what is the historical relationship of the black female body um, to the apparatuses of state power and to the, and to the boundaries of nationhood, right? Uh, and so Professor Holly, <coughs> one of the things that your question brings up for me, which is also refracted through last night's episode, um, is thinking about uh, pot potentially a concept like black female fugitivity, mm -hmm. right? You're talking about how to get away with murder? Um, no, or I'm talking about scandal, scandal cause she's, mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, and, and I'm thinking about captivity and fugitivity, right? So she was <coughs> captive, because when I saw illegality, the other thing I thought about because of how it visually appears is illegibility, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that inability to capture fully black womanhood, um, that this sort of notion about um, um, escape, right? And so it, there are all kinds of politics of escape that are happening here. So there's the way that o Olivia escapes into these dream sequences <coughs> and into her interior self that we don't have access to, mm -hmm. that creates, um, so in a piece that Treva and I wrote um, a couple of years ago now, oddly enough, um, there's a, what we talked about how um, her interiority was unsettling for folks because it meant that it was one of the few places, uh, Olivia Pope's interiority, where you didn't have access to black women's full selves, mm -hmm. right? And so that we're so used to black women being public mm -hmm. and therefore judging them as ratchet, and yet we're so deeply uncomfortable with them being private and interior, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about that as a generative possibility of, of fugitivity or mm -hmm. as a thing that can't be captured or as a thing that's always running away or trying to escape. Um, there's also a way that Liv is always trying to escape herself and her own demons, which, which is why she is an alcoholic, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's an alcoholic. alcoholic. <laughs> Strong. I just thought there was some good beautiful mind. in the drinking, <laughs> and I support it. But <laughs> I don't know that you can have a bowl of wine <laughs> <night. laughs> and uh, that be really healthy. So, you know, maybe we would want to talk about that. Um, so yeah, so you know, so, I, so it makes me think about um, notions of, of 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 a black womanhood that cannot be fully apprehended. Um, that so much of our tension is because she exceeds all of the scripts that we have. She doesn't fit the controlling images narrative. Um, we're not entirely sure. Um, so so like one of the critiques I heard a lot of was, I mean, from black from black men haters and from. Um, you know, other folks was, well, you know, how, are we gonna talk about how this this show is, you know, a narrative of state violence and how this black woman is uh, uh, reifying or um, shoring up, you know, acts of state violence because she's always saving folks so she can save things. And I'm like, yeah, technically, but you know, <laughs> but there's also the way to think, like, can we also talk about the possibility of the black female body as the thing that stitches the American nation state together, mm -hmm. wow. right? And is the thing that has always done that. And so yes, that's fundamentally violent, right? But if you, but that is a violence that black women are imbricated in and through, but I don't know that the right read of that is to then see black women as um, imperially complicit, right? I don't know that black women are imperialist, mm -hmm. right? So much as this is the position that we're always put in with regard to the nation state. So those are some of the things that I, I think about when I think about <laughs> Shondaland as a certain kind of dystopic narrative construction of the nation that puts the that puts the black female body as the thread that holds the nation state together on full display. Right? <clears throat> yeah. um, okay, uh, so uh, when I'm thinking about, thank you for starting that off, because that. Um, give me also a lot to think about. Um, so one of the things I think, I think about when I think about this question of protection and um, the law, I actually think about the ways that um, in Shondaland and that Olivia Pope sort of represents um, the extent to which black women sort of skirt outside of the law. So um, the way that black women are stitching together the, um, the politics, the ideology of freedom in the nation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I actually sort of, coming out of slavery, coming out of dealing with um, enslaved women and free women of color who are always sort of managing um, not necessarily in the breaks, um, I sort of challenge that in the breaks of, of what bondage means, but actually I think are composed of it, are comprised of it, um, in that they actually unstitch that, that idea mm -hmm. of freedom, right? So like um, this question of protection, um, I think Shondaland and Scandal in particular, and we can talk about the other shows, I'm thinking of Scandal because I'm thinking of the way that um, Olivia is actually never quite protected by anybody, you know? Like she is the lover of the president, and the president has there are these moments where he is both domineering but also um, very caring of her, very um, desiring of her, but doesn't necessarily translate to protection. In some ways, it also translates to these 
interesting vestiges of property. Um, there are ways that mm. she is um, Jake's lover, and he wants to stand in the sun with her, but he also it, he kills indiscriminately, including <laughs> one of her friends. <laughs> 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 um, there are ways that her father, who, if we're thinking of the, the um, gendered ideas of the Asian <coughs> empire, like the father as the head of household is the epitome of that in, in a lot of ways, that's the same ways that the president is the epitome of that for the nation and for the free world. And he's the last one to protect her, um, and yet also sort of the first. So I f find it interesting that um, Olivia can represent for us, can embody for us, and allow us to picture in some ways the actual terrain that enslaved and free women of color would have operated in um, as being um, lovers as being um, uh, taken over by slave owners, by people who are potentially their husbands, by uh, business partners, um, uh, by uh, who have, uh, person, uh, slave owners owning plantations, by um, masters in workshops, uh, by owners of property, even though they maybe are working the tavern or they're working um, uh, boarding places. Um, so there's ways that they are never quite, they don't actually fit into the typical mode of protection um, that the nation has set up for us, that ideas of gender, of sexuality, of society have set up for us, um, and can help us see how this is an incomplete project. Mm -hmm. um, but also can sort of help us see like how is protection, is protection really a, a useful narrative um, at mm -hmm. the end of the day? Is it something, um, is there something liberatory to it? I thought it was interesting in the last episode where um, Abby says, uh, God, what is it? You have to save yourself. Um, you're the only gladiator here. And there was a whole uproar, I remember, on Twitter. It was like, yes, girl, save yourself. You can do it. And I was kind of like, hmm, that's a funny thing. You know, there's something in there that's vestiges of kind of um, liberal body that can, you know, lift itself up and can be removed from all these kind of constraints right. of history, of, of, of society, of lack of resources, of slavery. But at the same time, it's like we want, you know, we want that, right? We sort of want that theme. Um, you don't want to be protected, but you do. And I think there's ways that uh, Olivia, at least, and I think we can talk about it in the other shows, but um, Olivia, at least, sort of traffics in, in some of those, in the, um, the underside of the legalities mm -hmm. that are supposed to, in theory, sort of watch over us. I was thinking of Project Pat. Don't say she don't want to be mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't say All right, no, no Sato Voce conversations. Yes. You got to lift it up. <laughs> so I, I also want to say um, thank you very much um, for having us here. And it's really a privilege to be um, with these extraordinary women and to um, have this conversation in real time and um, in, in flesh and body with you yeah. all that I feel we've been having for so long um, on social media. Um, I think I'm here in part because, um, or I, I understand why I'm here better um, by way of your question, which is I'm, I'm here as a black woman lawyer, I'm ha here as a black woman law professor, and mm -hmm. I think that's my entry point, why Thursday night mm -hmm. um, there's no other place I can be <laughs> <laughs> except, um, except with Olivia and with Annalise. Um, and, and this has really given me an opportunity to reflect on sort of why that is mm -hmm. um, something that um, is nothing short of a compulsion um, for me. Um, and I want to offer up, I think, the notion that um, these are two women um, as a set of ideas who are really um, themselves the embodiment of law. Um, mm -hmm. They are themselves um, the embodiment of legal authority. And what happens when we think about law and legal authority as embodied through black women mm -hmm. um, and these particular black women? Um, a lot of us, I think, have been um, watching reruns of various things um, in anticipation of this day. And I certainly have done my share of rewatching Scandal and, and How to Get Away with Murder in Tough particular. Homework. <laughs> 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 homework. Uh, but I also have been thinking about. Um, the other ways in which, for me, in my life, um, the images, um, the constructions of black women um, as lawyers, as agents of law, black women as law, um, have come to me. I had to go back to that text mm -hmm. that is Lonnie Guinier, mm -hmm. 1993. Um, we know the so story of story. Lonnie, um, nominated by, by Bill Clinton, dropped by Clinton, mm -hmm. in that extraordinary 18-minute press conference and yeah. she stands in front of a podium, withdraws her nomination, um, and I, I think like many of us, mm -hmm. if I could have leapt into the box, right, and stood with her at the podium would have. I was this close to my television mm -hmm. um, in part because this is the moment, right, in which I understand my guild, 
um, right? And who, who, well, the guild that I'm a part of, that, mm -hmm. that she stands for in such a painful way. Mm -hmm. um, it's no accident to me, perhaps in my own mind, that um, this week, while again mm -hmm. we're watching reruns, um, Loretta Lynch yes. um, mm -hmm. is um, there in front of the Senate um, and, um, and um, herself mm -hmm. um, becoming the text. Um, but I, I want to make the segue, if I can, to, to Scandal on How to Get Away with Murder because there are those Delta sisters in red. I don't know if any of you mm -hmm. have seen the images yeah. from the Senate chamber, um, and it's extraordinary, um, which is to say um, that's the moment for me that helps me make the connection between um, what might be um, the um, perhaps more academic questions about law and to recognize where how embodiment is so much a part of that, right? It's mm -hmm. in the red suits and the jackets and the sweaters mm -hmm. and the lapels, mm -hmm. right? And it is in that space um, on scandal and how to get away with murder where um, I think both Olivia and Annalise tell us something about black women lawyering um, through that um, embodiment that is the stiletto, right? That is the finely cut jacket. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That is all of that um, that you all have helped me come back to um, thinking about my own evolution um, in the courtroom and in the classroom. So, really um, so I want to take them mm -hmm. as text, and I hope we'll get to talk more about that. Uh, I, we absolutely have to, and I just want to add a, that, make sure that we ask a question about that juxtaposition of sorority sisters um, mm -hmm. at Loretta Lynch's moment and the VH1 <laughs> show. That has now been canceled. Mm -hmm. I, uh, for the um, Loretta Lynch moment, I don't know if <coughs> John sold so many red suits, mm -hmm. um, power mm -hmm. suits, but it was a powerful image. But then when you wrote Sorority <laughs> Sisters, mm -hmm. you know, if you're on Twitter like me, it immediately brings up um, yes. that VH1 show, which I can be in a room and admit, yes, I watched it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to turn to Blair, and I think we're all involved in, this, in these legal spaces, and these legal spaces are necessarily historic. Well, I'm very thankful to be here and, and thankful to have the opportunity to talk about a personal obsession and, <laughs> and turn it into to my work product. Um, That's a very lawyerly term. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'd love to, you know, so a bunch of things came to mind when I was thinking about um, Olivia Pope, because she's sort of the center of my interest in Chandelier, <coughs> as I think she is for most of us. Um, so first I thought of Olivia Pope maybe as a, a Harriet Tubman figure, right? So she's there, she's, she's already sort of dealt this world of law, of, of, of figuring out, so she has the, the technique of escape for her clients, right? So she shows up with a shotgun and she's ready to get you out of whatever <laughs> situation you're in. So I'm thinking, you know, the ways in which black women have, um, at the invisibility of the ways in which black women have um, been leaders uh, around mm -hmm. questions of legality, around questions of freedom, and the way in which their actions in and of itself question the morality of those laws, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but then I began thinking about sort of the, the, the worlds uh, that Olivia Pope has inhabited and the way that, you know, we've sort of devolved with Olivia. So when we start with Olivia, she has a pretty clear cut job. She's, you know, she's a legal cleaner. Like, so if you run into a bad situation, she can fix it for you. And she's very knowledgeable about the inside things. Her crew will do anything they need to to move you towards us. They'll move a body, they'll cover things up, they'll torture someone, they'll, they'll do whatever, you know, you need done. I and have so, a list. And so you think, you know, so Olivia's not a, a clean moral figure, right? She's not clean when it comes to of the basics of a law, neither are her clients, neither are the gladiators. But as, we, as the show goes on, we realize that this is surface. We think, oh, we've been led into something um, exciting and insightful that we don't know about the world. But she's operating on the surface. And there's the things that she does not know about the presidency. So she involves herself in um, you know, helping her lover win the election illegally. And she's, she's torn up. She's broken about that. But all of her colleagues are not. All of her colleagues are murderers and thieves <laughs> and liars and warmongers, right? So that whole crew of people are, are war in worse moral shape than Olivia. And then, then we devolve further and we meet her father. And we're like, oh my God, well, this is the guy who runs the CIA, you know, but on the, on the dark side. 
And so um, we, we, we move into his world where you, know, you, you put your wife in a pit for, I don't know, 10 years or something and pretend that she's dead. So you know, we, we keep devolving. And then this season has opened us up to seeing a, a further devolve, that her father was actually protecting her from a whole crew of people we've never even heard of yet. We don't even know what's going to happen now. And so um, I, I think of her as sort of a, an interesting sort of moral guide through this, but, but also not really knowing where she's going and not really really having any sort of legal hold mm -hmm. anymore. Her being a lawyer, how does that serve her yeah. in this sort of extra legal world? And, and so for me, that is an interesting metaphor about blackness, that if we inhabit a world where the rules don't cover us, where the things that we've studied and held up as, as the truths of our life really have no meaning anymore. Mm -hmm. when, when it comes to us, it doesn't really happen. So, so I think it's an interesting sort of critique of what we, we think of as law as sort of being transcendent of us rather than something that is sometimes very surface and, and not very helpful. And the last thing I thought about historically was the term gladiator. Right, so when we hear that, we're like, yeah, they're gladiators. She wears that snatched white coat. She has her hat on. And she's got gloves and she's snatching. So we're really excited about gladiators. But gladiators are performers for the state to keep people distracted. Gladiators are not warriors. Gladiators are war enslaved people who work for the glory of the state. Right? Mm -hmm. And they distract people from the real things going on. Mm -hmm. So even the choice of the term gladiator mm -hmm. is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. So that she is, her body, her, the folks around her are being used to keep this state going. Mm -hmm. So what we, it seems we have that can be a thread here is whether or not the law is something that sutures. Um, the black woman's body is something made by law and at the same time, outside of law, and it's that necessary, necessarily dialect, necessary dialectic between those two positions that sort of allows Olivia to emerge. And I also want to hear where Annalise is in this, because she's a professor. You know, she's up there sort of teaching the law at the same time as your word devolution. She, things, mm -hmm. things are quickly falling apart, Chinua Achebe. So <laughs> the whole notion <laughs> of the professor way. being in a position to instruct and at the same time use the law to her own. Is this a woman with, are these women with power or are these women made because of the authority of the state? One of the terms I've been playing around with and thinking about the moral universe that they inhabit, which is also perhaps about the legal universe and universe of power, is and it's and, and Blair is making me think more about this, is that it's it's a post-moral universe, right? It's mm -hmm. not amoral, it's not it's decidedly immoral. Mm -hmm. But what but what mm -hmm. happens is that you can't ever pin down what's right or what's wrong, mm -hmm. right? What's right or wrong That's is true. dependent on who yeah. you're supposed to be supporting. And so part of our own disor you know, our feeling of being disoriented sometimes when we watch, I think, is that we're you know, we're like we're on the side of people who we don't really support their choices <laughs> though. Um, but we sort of fundamentally believe and live in, in the project that she represents. And so how do you believe in the representational project of a, of a person um, and the possibilities that you hear when, when they do call up everything that you know to be unsavory about the operations of state power in black lives and women's lives, right? So, um, so I've been thinking about what would happen if we thought about this as a post-moral universe and thinking of black folks in, in the ways that Blair says as um, never quite uh, being you can't ever quite read us or take our experiences in relationship to the accepted or authoritative narratives. Uh, and so what does that mean? Um, so, so that's one thing. The other thing that's interesting, um, Carla, that your question raises for me is about uh, watching Annalise. Um, so last night in that episode where she, where the test becomes, she takes, the, yeah. <laughs> she takes their lot, th this thing that they've done, this crime they've committed, and she spins it as a narrative, right? But then, but she says to them, so now what you have the opportunity to do is use this classroom mm. to create your own pathway to freedom, mm. right? To figure out how to get out of this horrendous set of things that you have done. So that is it's every kind of, right, isn't it? Right, because it's, um, one, because it becomes interesting how a fact pattern of things they've actually done gets re-narrated in any way that they choose to construct it, right? Um, and so, I mean, one, I mean, so so the postmodern literary folks should love it. Um, but, but also, 
that that is what black women professors do in the academy, right? As we step into classrooms and we say to students, whatever backgrounds you bring, we can your narrative matters we here. We can work with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Your narrative matters here and it can become a map to your own freedom depending on how you arrange it, how you think about it, how you use the resources that you get in this classroom and mail them together. Um, so, and, and, and what's interesting too, I mean, when I watch her, because even though I'm not a law professor, I'm just a professor, but when I watch her, I just think about how your life could be falling apart. Your dude ain't acting right. Your side dude is acting sketchy. <laughs> uh, you know, um, you have a bunch of students who are raggedy and are, you know, needy and, and, um, and you, and then you have all these pressures to perform. But when you step into the room, you look mega accomplished, right? People see the outward, right? But when you go home and take your wig off, it's like, <laughs> It's like, you know, because we were talking about her taking it off, but it's like, y'all, remember, that taking that off is also because we about to fight, because right. we about to go down. And so, um, you know. The so earrings that's a, came right, up first. So that's a glamour. Yeah. Right, y'all know black women have a grandma. Let me take this bracelet off. Give her back. All she needed was that Vaseline. And, and she had it. Y'all know Shonda was signifying on that kind of grammar. I'm not making that up. Right? <laughs> and so, um, so for me, there's also just that, right? The ability to see that um, and to think about what it means that um, so much of our academic lives and our professional lives in this moment, if we want to think about moments, are tied to the performativity of looking respectable and looking like you have it all together. Okay, thank you. And then you get you watch on TV and you're like, she ain't got nothing together. The only thing she has together is her brilliance when she steps on the stage of that classroom. Mm -hmm. But everything else is falling apart. Uh, and I know that has been my life at some point, and I certainly know it's been the lives of some of my homies. So, um, <laughs> you know, so I feel like that is also the space. And, and, and here's the thing that I wonder about. When we're really uncomfortable with those kind of representations, is it because they feel so true for us and what we want TV to be is a space of fugitivity and escape, mm -hmm. right? And so when it forces us to confront ourselves and see that, you know, see that messiness, some of us revel in that because it feels real and affirming, other yeah. folks, I think, want us to forever be clear hosts. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so we can't say bye, Felicia, the way we like. <laughs> I okay. said bye. Yeah, I, I said, said bye, bye too. Mm -hmm. So, okay, okay, we're dealing with yeah. both morality, fugitivity, yeah. and the notion of, and you, we would get to it, respectability politics. Take us mm -hmm. up, or <laughs> Jessica, or Blair, well, Martha, wherever. Well, I just kind of want to add on to, as far as the question of sort of Annalise and how you know power operates, just to think about um, what Blair's already said about, about scandal and about, mm -hmm. about Olivia and also happened with Grey's Anatomy and Grey, like that there's mm -hmm. a lot of layers that, um, that Shonda mm -hmm. Rhimes and the writers sort of unfold in Shonda Land over a lot of time. It took us a long time to get to <laughs> Olivia and Papa Pope and Mama Pope we haven't necessarily talked that much about in their relationship um, to actually get to, oh, there's a lot laying under this. Um, to then a scene that for me, like in this last this last episode, was so much about ideas of bondage and ideas of terror and how you know what is the making and a making of um, of a slave, right? And mm -hmm. um, what does that actually mean in practice? How does that look? How does that feel? Does it look um, like um, Mama in the basement? Does it look like Mama in the basement? Does it look like you <laughs> coming out of a box and realizing you're in another box? You know, like do you, does it look like negotiations with power? Like yes, all of these questions end up kind of coming up. But it took us four seasons to get there. You know, because we start off with Olivia in the white suit with, you know, well, her biggest problem is that she's sleeping with the president. And, I mean, let me, okay. let me just pause. <laughs> her biggest problem is she's sleeping with the president. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> just, so, you know, and that is a problem, but there's also ways that you can play with it and be like, oh, well, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so I, I just want to kind of think about, you know, like, to as we think about Annalise as a figure and the way that she's operating with power, I actually don't think we know what she wants yet. We know mm -hmm. that she's messy. We know that there's a lot that is going on in her personal life and also in her life as a professor. She uses her students in some really problematic ways. Um, but we're not, we have yet to really unpack, you know, what is, how do you get away with murder? Mm -hmm. And whose murder is Annalise trying to get away with? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think as we do that, that's where we're gonna, it's, that's the interesting thing about Shonda and like thinking about power and where it operates. 
like she takes these iconic huge figures the professor the lawyer the president um, the cleaner and then asks us to kind of think about okay but how does power actually operate in practice mm -hmm. in their lives and also in the lives of who they're impacting right. how are they um, what power can they access mm -hmm. and who has power over that that, they're, that which they're accessing and then we find that in the end of the day, like everybody has somebody in power over them. Even the right. president ends up being beholden to Papa Pope in the last couple episodes. Mm -hmm. He's talking to him like, "Oh, you're my lost father." <laughs> you know, like it's just. Or I'm, I, and, and Papa Pope says that he's like, yeah, I'm, your, "I'm your concubine. I'm your lover. I'm your father. I'm your mother. I'm your friend. I'm your elder. I'm your son." Like he's all these things. And it's a bit much. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It is a lot. But I think that it's it's interesting in that um, in this question of who has moral authority and mm -hmm. who gets the authority of power that in Shyamalan these things are, are all really slippery and show us that power in some ways is more dynamic than we give it credit for, you know, which is something that we can learn as we're thinking about social movements, that it's not one thing that we then have to take down or one system or one person that it's actually, that these things are much more interrelated um, than we maybe give space to. That makes sense. I, uh, I want to hear from Martha and Blair on this, but I'm, I note that you ended back with this idea of power and morality and both of those being slippery. And the idea of the law is it's supposed to um, shape it in a way that's manageable, that we can come to a solution from whatever set of problems we have. Except we're dealing with these notions of a slippery concept of morality, um, where the, either the president is a good person to be involved with, the best person there is, or this is real trouble. So I, I wonder if if you might not only take up from where Jessica um, start, left off, but also give us a sense of how the law is supposed to function in this sort of equal protection universe, but at the same time maybe telling us consistently that there is no equal protection if you're a black woman. I mean, so this is, I mean, this is a long debate among critical we legal have about scholars. An hour. <laughs> <laughs> critical legal scholars, right? You know, sort of, you know, sort of what is the function of law, right? Mm -hmm. Is law um, the embodiment of rights of sort of inalienable um, claims or, or rights as malleable as sort of any other precept that we might offer up? Um, <coughs> and I think that um, I want to come back to that space of, of the classroom yeah. um, because um, I think it's a for me, important to um, frame Annalise in that space of the classroom, in the law classroom, um, as a site of contestation, an ideological space, um, a space um, that we recognize is just um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the day before, one of the deans at a law school had to come out and admonish the students to no longer remark in their evaluations about women professors, clothing and attire, etc. It had to formally admonish the student body and put this off the table. So it's a, it, it's a fraught space, we know that. Um, and to watch Annalise navigate that, right, I think is, is to remember um, that there are no rules, right? That everybody in that space is constructing a kind of authority um, partly out of morality. Except isn't it important that it pretends that it is not a fraught space? Absolutely, yeah. and that's what, so when I think about her physicality in that space, right, the way she paces the front of that room, the way she wields the Socratic method in a way that's almost a parody of the Socratic mm. method <laughs> for most of us today, right, is, is the dramatization, right, of how one then um, grapples with yeah. exactly that question mm -hmm. for me. Um, and so I think that um, uh, down to um, who gets to say um, what the canon is, right? What you teach, what the rules are, and what matters. So one of the objections to Annalise, right, is that every class seems to turn, right, on some deep self-interest. But we might no, say like that's always what the law classroom mm -hmm. is, right? That's mm -hmm. what that's what canons are about, right? Mm -hmm. Is precisely about ideology driving about what's in and what's out, what's taught and what's not, um, the canon, the anti-canon, and so what happens, right? And how disturbed are we um, by the possibility mm -hmm. that a black woman um, can command the law classroom? She can be the embodiment of law, and she can also tell us what the canon is, what matters, what's in, what's out. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on all the time. But she's making law by her is. very she presence. Is. She is. Um, so I want to go back to the sort of question of 
presentation, mm -hmm. right? And so you were talking about the law professors presenting something to students that they find problematic over and over and over again in very gendered ways, right? And so I, I, what I, what's interests me is the degree to which, so when I'm watching Scandal or How to Get Away with Murder on Twitter, with the rest of my Us. community. <laughs> Part of what we revel in is the respectability. Mm -hmm. Like what we get excited about are the suits and the gloves and the white sofa that we know she's gonna be mad about mm -hmm. when she gets back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget the bags. Yeah, the bags, the shoes, the boots, the you know, everything is just impeccable. The hair that never gets messed up. You can go into captivity and you just look a little better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little change, you know, get a texture change like on. the style last yeah, night. Yeah, no, you look beautiful at every turn. She looked like, I, I tweeted that she looked like she was in a very interesting yoga class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, was just, she was just trying things. And so we, we enjoy that. We enjoy the Annalise, you know, the putting on and the taking off. And so I think that the, the, the putting on and the taking off and the showing and the straightening your hair when you get back from the mm -hmm. sun and all those things that, that happen magically. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> we don't, when, where, who does Olivia Pope's hair? Where is her stylist? That's and what was she line. doing in the shower, getting her hair wet? What was it going to look yes, like? Yes, what was it going to look that? like when she got out? And her stylist must have been standing right there. Do you remember? That? Yeah. Yeah. Right together. <laughs> <laughs> the island she had the hair and makeup crew. Derek <laughs> <laughs> yes. But but part of but part of what's interesting to me is that we enjoy we enjoy the putting on and the taking off. So I, to me, it's a consciousness about respectability that we all okay. have. Mm -hmm. And we all see it as a tool that we can put on and use for our own power, to wield our classrooms, to, to command a room, and then we can take it off. We, it's not who we are. We, we recognize it as a problematic tool, a complicated tool, a tool that may alienate someone mm -hmm. who doesn't have those things to put on or to take off, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I love the sort of way in which this generation is really just done with the idea that somehow you know pulling up your pants and putting on a tie means that people will protect you or right. take care of you yes. or value your children not right. or so, not shoot you right. for yeah. no apparent reason. Uh, so we, we've sort of, in this generation, probably not mine, but in this generation, mostly in the room, we've dropped that thought and, and thank God for that. But it's still interesting the way in which we still play in the, the coming in and the going out um, for ourselves and for our own performances and, and for our own consumption mm -hmm. as enjoyable. Because mm -hmm. um, I think one of the most um, important but also the most challenging dimensions of um, our conversations for me have been about the politics of pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, you all are teaching me a great deal about how to think in very new ways about um, old scenes mm -hmm. that I understand. and so. Um, the thing I would add um, is that in reflecting on uh, both, uh, both uh, Liv and Annalise um, is to reread all of that um, through the lens of pleasure. So I was remembering last night and when I got home um, my very first suit. You know, mm -hmm. young lawyer, um, I can remember this. I was in Sims, where are my New Yorkers? My yeah. old New Yorkers. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, in the Sims, I'm on a budget, but you know, I'm, I'm putting on the suit. I can remember the, the blue and the pink pinstripes, the feel of the buttons, um, how, you know, my stockings felt when they, you know, sort of rubbed up against the lining of the, the pencil skirt, the big shoulder pads. <laughs> you know, so, I I could read, you know, so I could tell you that story about the suit. You know, as a, a you know, as a constraining, right? Is conformance as constraining as as a mask, as a uniform? Um, but I would have to confess, right, um, that when I walked into the courthouse, I felt good. <laughs> <laughs> I liked how I looked. I felt good, and 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 I don't think that I. So it is partly generational. You know mm -hmm. that I was um, I came of age um, by way of women like Paulette Caldwell and. Patricia Williams, my teacher, um, who told narratives of black woman lawyers, black woman law professors um, that were um, that were strife and burdened, right? They were strife and burdened and didn't have the possibility of acknowledging that moment when um, I unbuttoned that jacket strategically, and I, and I know, right? I, I know what I'm doing. Right? I know what I'm performing, um, and I couldn't I couldn't speak of that. I think 
-hmm. without access to this conversation. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm grateful. So is the authority in, in our being able to to watch, um, to, to be the spectator on that kind of power, and at the same time know we can command it ourselves? Is this where our obvious enjoyment of, mm -hmm. you know, Deep, very fine details in these performances by at least these two actors that we're talking about on <laughs> Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder. Um, or are these women in a kind of danger that we are not um, engaging because we'd much rather see them as the president will save me? You know, equal protection under the law will save me. Mm -hmm. um, so is it is it the power we're enjoying or the danger of pleasure that we're enjoying. Both? Okay. Um, I was thinking about that moment last night where she was like, because I'm Olivia Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and it yeah. means nothing. It means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> was right. that when she was in the basement yeah. room mm. and the cold mm. cement mm. and we were saying so girlfriend? She was so she was having to acknowledge that all the stuff, like all the putting on, uh, for her city that she does. But she also uh, meant, I am Olivia Pope. Right. She right. meant she meant it in, in one part and of her mind. Oh, like, 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 like returning right, but, herself. But you don't know about right? what it, what it, <laughs> well, the thing it made me think about is what it means for her to sort of grapple with coming undone and then having to put herself back together, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, because this is a moment where politically we feel undone and where every, you know, our, when, when the uh, Eric Garner decision, non-decision came down and Treva just was like, I'm undone. And I was like, that's the word, right? That's the word, and so the, um, because respectability is about being done, hair done, nails done, everything done, right? <laughs> um, the nails done, even after she scratched up the wall. Oh, oh, never looked bad. Wait, 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 I want to push back on that because you can you can have a performance, you can have an embodied, expressive performance, and it not be respectable, and you still want to be done, like you still want to be beat, you still want to have everything together. Maybe you so want I think it more than. I think there's a work there that talking about. Uh, politics of respectability asks us to do. Like it's a doneness in the service of a kind of power relation, but also in the service of, of pushing um, out other kinds of representations, that this is the proper and appropriate representation. And this is not, I'm not thinking of respectability across time and space. Mm -hmm. It is changed, it's different, it has its mm -hmm. uses. Mm -hmm. In particular, historical moments, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, there's a work that we want respect that respectability, that peace does, that maybe it's interesting to separate from just the performance of being done, of mm. being done up, and that, um, and I think that that, for, so well, it's thinking about the kind of pleasurable aspects of the power, like I actually mm -hmm. find it very pleasurable that these things are taken apart, that sh that Olivia can have her hair laid, but also have this messy relationship with Jake and Fitz, like there's something about that to me mm. that it says, mm -hmm. you know, like, yes, like it's, it is a one, it is one skill to, um, to be put together in a particularly black female way, yeah. you know, um, uh, and it's another skill, black womanhood way, and there's another skill of, you know, navigating different relationships, and these things don't, the pleasure for me is that these things don't have to be tied together, at least right. as we're watching mm -hmm. them, and that in reality, they are usually tied together. Right? Saying, this makes respectable people have very messy lives. This mm -hmm. makes me think about Ida yeah. B. Wells, mm -hmm. and we have the pleasure with Ida B. Wells of the, a very modern kind of person living in a, an earlier time, and her voice is very clear to us now, and one of my favorite places to find her voice is in her diary yes. mm -hmm. when she's young, and she's going through this, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. She's going, she's doing racial justice work in an extreme extremely dangerous time, right? She's doing work that none of us are doing, right? Mm -hmm. She is trying to stop lynching when there is no one concerned. There are no allies. She's, you know, waging a, a movement where there are probably about 20 people in the nation who are concerned about it mm -hmm. and willing to put their names and their bodies on the line to do that work. And yet she cares about how she looks. Yeah. And she's worried about her hair and getting the fabric so that she can get the dress put together. And she and then she says to herself, like, well, I should I guess I shouldn't be worried about that, but I am. I like it. And it, it's important to me. And it, and she's trying to perform a womanhood for a world that refuses to see her as a lady, as someone deserving protection and respect. And she, and, but she's still important to her. It's part of her armor because she knows who she is inside of herself. So even though the clothes don't change the world, the way the world sees her, and she knows that, the clothes make her feel something in that particular moment, in a very yeah. fraught moment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we sometimes we're, we're quick to say, well, you were trying to perform something for right. someone else. But sometimes we're trying to convince ourselves. Yeah. We're yeah. trying to say, okay, this is who I, I am, Olivia Pope. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get, I just, I don't know how, 
but I'm going to get there. <laughs> so uh, and let's just interrogate for a moment where that respectability lies then. Is it mm -hmm. in the performance? Is it in the moral character? Is it in the... You know, I have to admit, I bought a bag far too expensive because of Olivia Pope. <laughs> I'm still paying off this bag, but I like it. Uh -huh. So, and I don't know, maybe this bag is performing something for me. So when you see it, you just understand that she's, you know, I'm, I'm going for that respectability, Jean. So what is it that we're after with respectability? Is it interior, exterior? Who's going to give it to? And let me take it back to um, Shonda Rhimes, to Annalise or to Olivia. I mean, isn't but some of it isn't it just about like that we enjoy it, right? I enjoy a nice bag. It looks fly, but they, you know, like my mama just my mama is a you know is is bad and she likes bags. So, <laughs> so any fashion sense I have, my mama gives it to me literally. So she bought me a bag for Christmas. And I just be feeling, I'm like, this leather so smooth. <laughs> <laughs> know that. Like, yes, so so it's, you know, so it's that right that we recognize quality, but it's also that um, it, I mean, look. Sometimes, even in a in a neoliberal universe where we work harder than we've ever worked before, mm -hmm. and we still seem what? to never have enough. That's right? it. Right. Yeah. Sometimes, just saying, look, it ain't that I can afford it. It ain't that people think I should have it. But damn it, I want it. Right. I want it because I work hard and because it looks pretty. And you know, so I, so look, I think we do ascribe some external exterior things right around look and performance and, and or whatever, but a lot of times you know that, like, where my folks live, I'm like, I know that this person walking up this particular street with that very nice coach bag ain't balling out of control. Um, so it's very clear visually, if you carrying the coach bag in the hood to your house in the projects, like, we're not, we're not under any um, illusions about like that doesn't tell that doesn't fool us into thinking you're doing better than you do. Right? Mm -hmm. It actually does not, right? Mm -hmm. So it is about. So then it can't. So it can't just be about fooling people into thinking that you're something that you're not. So much as if if these are the things that we say are objects of value in our society, then surely other folks want those accoutrements and adornments too, and it only becomes a problem when we want them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? Right. And so. You know, I don't know. So for me, I just, I think that we, like, I think that there's always the broader critique about what we're performing and putting on, but also that we've created a world in which so many of the nice things that we're taught to want elude folks, and then we resent them when they're like, well, I'm going to have it anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have it despite whether I, you think I deserve it or I've worked hard enough for it or I can afford it. I'm just going to go ahead and have it, right? Um, and so then what does that mean? So that's one thing. But the other thing I... I want to say, because I'm, I'm, I'm also I'm thinking about the title of our panel, the Janelle Monae line, right? Um, mm -hmm. The booty don't lie. Um, hmm? Right, and then but then at the end she says, uh, so Janelle Monae comes back and says, even when you try to ask me, the booty don't lie, right? Um, and so you know I wonder too about one. I mean, can we talk about the sex scenes? I mean, because I watch for the sex scenes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In uh, can we talk yeah. about yeah. <laughs> I mean, why people being with another type of way? Like, you know. <laughs> I mean, if we don't talk about, I mean, y'all call mm -hmm. a panel. It, it, so the the panel, panel title is. Yeah. Are we going to go away from respectability? No, no, no. But, but, no, no, but, but respectability and sex go that. together. <laughs> but I'm, I'm saying that that's also part of it, too, right? Is that the thing that bothers me about the, like, respectability conversation as well is that. What some of the tension about the respectability stuff is about the fact that Olivia Pope has good sex with right. lots of people, with her two people anyway, <laughs> um, and and then and, and then one of the opening scenes in How to Get Away with Murder is Annalise getting it in it. on that mm -hmm. desk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, and so we don't. So I just wonder, like, part, so it seems to me that part of the reason that we're so generationally invested in throwing off respectability is because we want to have a conversation about. How do you have an intimate life as a black professional woman um, that you know that can be messy, but it's also just about pleasure and about you asking for what you need and about you finding partners that are willing to give it to you. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that we are having that conversation because you know I say this you know to my homegirls a lot. Like black women have a whole sort of thing, particularly hetero, hetero, straight black women, around wanting to get chose. Mm -hmm. Come on, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you see what. Y'all know what I'm saying, right? You want somebody to choose you, right? You want so so you see Olivia and she got dudes like she ultra chose, she super chose. She chose long, you know, like she just getting chose, right? And so over over. So she 
so that there's something about being able to see not just our desire for the things we want, which is about respectability politics, but also getting to see black women be desired. Mm, right, yeah, then. objects of desire. Yes, mm-hmm. as objects of desire, and then as having the power and agency to respond to that desire in a myriad of ways to accept something. So she's to got Edison it. after her. She's got Fitz right. and Jake. And with Edison, she's like, I don't really want what you're bringing, though, because I got these other dudes, mm-hmm. and so I just want them. Right. And so we, so many folks want that kind of power, but they want to be desired. And I, and I guess for me, the respectability frame doesn't allow us to talk about what happens when you are when you are the object of desire and it's not illegal it's illicit but it's not illegal but maybe right. that is exactly the frame that allows us to talk about it because if we didn't mm-hmm. have the other to respond to then that ease of leaning into the conversation about sexual desire and sexual pleasure which might also be the the want in in both of these shows that we're talking mm-hmm. about um, It allows us to go there because of this extraordinary veneer of respectability. I mean, what's more respectable than a room in the White House Mm -hmm. that is used for a particular purpose? Mm So, I don't know, Martha, I saw it. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to think about a space in which um, these two sort of ways of thinking come together, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and and, um, so so I'm a a storyteller. So so I just offer you up this scene. when I arrive in the Midwest in my university and I begin to walk the corridors, um, I wear shoes that click on the floor. <laughs> my shoes go click, click, click on the floor. And I become the subject of commentary. I can always, I hear when you're coming, um, I know it's you. And so here's this moment where sort of my you know, sort of my notion of kind of my respectable law prof, you know, my suit, my, my heel, all of that click down the floor, gets turned inside out. And, 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 and now and now it's coming very close to this space that is about sexuality, mm-hmm. that is about desire. Mm-hmm. Not, it's not my desire, right? <laughs> but it, it's about, you know, it, it's approaching that. Right. And so, but my, so my response, I mm-hmm. think, to your, your point, Brittany, is partly, um, it has to be about my frame of reference, right? Because right. that's the only stability that there is, right? Mm-hmm. That I can, I can adorn myself in a way that I might be deemed respectable in some objective frame, right. but when my shoes click down the corridor in a world where everybody is wearing clogs and Arche and other crepe soles, <laughs> um, <right>. now <laughs> it's turned on, you know, it, it, it's turned on me. And, um, and <laughs> Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we do, yes, thank you. Yes, you know my world. <laughs> and, and, um, and so it has to be my, you know, it, it has to be Olivia's friend, right? It has, it has to come back to that. Yeah, and I, I just want to go along with that a little bit because I'm finding it, I, I kind of want to go, okay, I kind of want to go back to the first panel and, and Treva's last remarks about finding new adjectives. I'm just finding it difficult to pull respectability all the way through Shondaland. Mm-hmm. Um, in part because Olivia herself seems like as a figure sort of transcends all the ways we want to think about even class, race, gender. Like if, the, if this is like a post-moral universe or a, an unmoral mm-hmm. universe, whatever we want to think about it, then respectability then bottoms out from her. Like whatever is respectable, um, if she is sort of the the gladiator in power, then the things that she does, uh, she sort of determines that. She's sort of the, the compass for it. Like mm-hmm. one of the, in the very first episode, and I think it's the only time that I see anything respectability politics related. Um, Quinn comes in, she's just meeting Olivia, and Olivia's like, too much cleavage. It's mm-hmm. like the first words that she mm-hmm. says to her. Mm-hmm. But I don't think anything else like that happens, and the next thing we know, she's sleeping with the president. So then this question of sort of <laughs> what is respectable and what is moral mm-hmm. end up being you know, folded, t- folded together in some strange ways. I don't know, I'm just having, I'm having some trouble <coughs> pulling that thread through all the way because I'm not sure that we are doing enough work to unpack it what we understand to be the trappings of respectability, mm-hmm. whether it's stilettos, whether it's relaxed hair, whether it's the power suit, from what is ac- what respectability politics actually meant to do or has asked us to do as far as what we want how we want to represent ourselves to power. And then mm-hmm. how that slide how that scale slides, you know, like mm-hmm. how, okay, well I'm wearing stilettos, but now I'm on display in way of, you know, like mm-hmm. the story is talking about, I'm on display in ways that, you know, are problematic because the respectability here is wearing your yoga pants to work. Or the you know, res- like there's an interesting, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's just an interesting play here that I wonder if we're asking it to do, asking respectively how to do too much work in talking about Olivia and yeah. Annalise that maybe is not as useful. I, I that's, wanna, that's all. I, I yeah. want to go back to Brittany's question about desire and sex. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Let's not jump. Mm -hmm. Let's go on talk. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's interesting to see a woman who is donning <laughs> the gloves. You know, like, because she's not, I mean, respectability is in the gloves. Cause, I mean, my mama was from the 1950s, yes. and she had a whole different kind of selections of gloves that she would wear with different outfits. Ones with Wait, I don't know anything about gloves. I don't know gloves, <laughs> and I don't want to. It's a little complex for me, you know, other than staying warm. But but Olivia's not wearing those gloves to stay warm. She's wearing them because she's wearing a three-quarter length sleeve on that jacket that she knew that she so she went and bought those gloves on purpose <laughs> to go with that so she, you know she is inhabiting something because she knows the but, proper choice that you should make but she but but she looks better than any there's no one else in the white house with the three-quarter length coat and the special gloves so she's doing this for herself like she's not doing it for the space of the white house she's doing because like i can fly above you it marks I can actually her look, yeah it, it marks her as really exceptionally different from a different time and a different kind of place and, and, but the other, the other piece of that is that it, it merges with her desire. Like part of um, the, the, the way the sex scenes are constructed is that you see the sort of, you know, the pulling up of the beautiful dress and the hooch. Like she doesn't have a lot of like, let's get all the way undressed sex. She has a lot of like, I am still in my pretty clothes sex. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's a play right. at, you know, I, un underneath this stuff, I can be who I want. I can desire who I want. I can make bad choices and good choices. I can make choices of men who really, to me, don't seem to desire her. They seem to, des to desire to beat that man. Yeah. That Jake cares yeah. to beat the president. The president mm -hmm. cares to beat Jake. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're real excited about Olivia because they don't want the other guy to win. They know each other personally. So, it's, it's about their mm -hmm. clashing of the dicks that's more <laughs> the, the fight there rather than Olivia. If the other one's not there, I don't know that they care because you know the president isn't unmarried and Jake isn't like a regular person with a regular job. They're, they're both engaged in their own world. I, I love the way you said he isn't unmarried. You know? Yeah, no, <laughs> he's married okay. to his crazy wife and um, chill. And, and there's a way in which we need to talk about where men and black men have roles mm. in these. And I think maybe more interesting in the last, sh in the How to Get Away with Murder and what's happening with the black males in that show. But um, I, want, I want you to talk just briefly about the males and then I'd like to open it up to questions because I have a feeling folks would like to um, join this conversation and, and some might want to talk about sex and desire in a way well, I don't know. You got pretty close. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she went to school. Yeah. 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 So that has already let us in. <laughs> so, Bertha. So, I, so I'm going to try this because um, uh, what I'm thinking is um, about the high wire, the, the life on the high wire, um, whether it's um, yeah. whether it's you know sex in the utility closet, mm -hmm. um, or it's that courtroom scene where you are where you are um, speaking of your, uh, your husband as if he's a, a third party, you know, sort of unrelated mm -hmm. to you to exonerate a client, um, or you're Olivia in a whole array, array of, of, uh, of scenes and hijinks, um, that um, the pleasure of the pleasure of the high wire, of the risk, um, yeah. is, is, is there a, is there a, is there a more powerful aphrodisiac? I'm sure there is, but Empower? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, th then no, then the, then the risk, right? The, then the risky stuff, right? The clandestine stuff, the risky stuff, where you're way out there. But for um, a black woman, is that risk the same kind of thing mm -hmm. that we would play with in this environment as we would for, let's say, a white woman? So her risk has the equal protection of a white woman's risk in this environment? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great question. And the, the threat yeah. of outing her when mm -hmm. it comes, when she's known maybe mm -hmm. as the possible right. mistress right. And, mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and that, you know, to me, risk is adrenaline, right? Yeah. That's a certain kind, but it comes with a cost, because if we all that's live it, on adrenaline, it. we are actually killing ourselves. Right. 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 So that's why black women die right. younger, Absolutely. and that's why we suffer more disease, is right. because we're running on Absolutely. a constant adrenaline right. throughout mm -hmm. our lives. So for, for Olivia, this is, this is pleasurable, but it's also deadly. Right. Mm -hmm. Like literally deadly. Right. I think well. you've got at the juxtaposition or this yeah. the space 
between the worlds mm -hmm. that these extraordinarily powerful women um, operate in and choose to. And I want to argue or suggest that respectability itself might be something we elevate from that old archive of <laughs> just the gloves mm -hmm. to a moment where I can be respectable in the bedroom, in the whatever, my level of respect, my mm -hmm. determination, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. self-determination mm -hmm. about what that would mean. Um, do black men have a role in this sort of articulation of where the protection of these women lie? I mean, so Daddy Pope is the main black male character in, in this. And mm -hmm. I, I find him very interesting because, you know, well, except one, he gives those best Shonda speeches, right? Yeah. Shonda. Yes. Oh, Shonda. Yeah. And, oh, and, and, you know, he foretells the future. <laughs> and he's a magical <laughs> Negro. He's kind of magical. I don't even know how he does all of them. He disappears. He's trying to catch him. He's like, Whoop. And so, you know, he, he really is sort of um, an amoral compass to this, yes, you know, post moral world. He's, he's, you know, calling the president a boy. And saying like, you know, I don't know. So it's, it's an interesting yeah. juxtaposition that the president would normally have been empowered to call him a boy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet he's like, no, you, you're just, you're playing here and I'm letting you play here and I let you do all these things. But really there's a, there's a deeper world behind this. And so it's interesting to have the, the black man uh, sort of be that voice in this universe. But, but I think, you know, for black men consuming the show, oftentimes, you know, I, when I told someone I was on this panel, they're like, I have a critique. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, what's your critique? <coughs> well, I mean, why is she having sex with white men? You know, and that's, you know, yeah, somehow a critique. Um, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, the, the choice not to center black men as love interests, as sort of um, the, the powerful person uh, emotionally, right in Olivia's life is an interesting one and a provocative one in, in comparison to the stories we have told about black women in the past. And I, I think that's what draws a lot of black women to the story and what repels some black men from, you know, honestly even really watching it very well. Because that man then told me that he didn't actually watch the show. Just, <laughs> just a memory. Remember, oh, I think it was Sula, Toni Morrison's, yes. where, you know, the thing that condemned her finally was yes. that she slept with white men. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so here's another woman acting outside of her role. Mm -hmm. But what condemned her in the community's eyes was sleeping with white men. Well, my crowning glory on Twitter was when I tweeted that Papa Pope was the head of the Illuminati. Because <laughs> 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 clearly, we search 613 as the Illuminati. <laughs> that explains so. Saint Joe Ward retweeted me. I was like, I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we've had we had Papa Pope, we've had um, Edison Cosby 2.0 because y'all know he looked like Edison. <laughs> Who was a boring and uninteresting. <laughs> he was very boring. And controlling. Mm -hmm. um, I never and feeling like entitled. Dull. And so he got so shut down. Uh, and and, 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 uh, and Harrison, right? <laughs> like uh, Team off. Gingham. Um, rest is, rest <laughs> piece, he was cute. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what, you know, um, in, in the piece of treatment art, one of the things we talked about with Harrison is that, you know, at least in the first couple seasons of the show, um, black men were really uncomfortable with him, and, and everybody wanted this sexual angle. But mm -hmm. he, Harrison's role was like what the what that black woman secretary is usually in every in, um, show, right? They're yeah. supportive. They keep everybody together. They go in and motivate mm -hmm. people. <laughs> they're like they're out for the cause, right? They're like the person that you call to go get a talking to to the like errant white girl, right? It's like get your life together. What are you doing? And so he was he that was. dude. Like he was that character. He was just a dude, right? Yeah. Because if it had been a woman doing all the things that Harrison did a black woman like a, a like a person of size she would have been short and fat and you know yeah. you know short and rotund and well um, she's on Grey's Anatomy right she's on Empire right. and so she didn't say Empire, Empire. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Becky with the blonde hair um, Empire y'all know Empire signifies <laughs> this just goes to show you Mark is going to have to have the Empire family Gabby is a blonde girl named Becky <laughs> of a black woman, his role would make perfect sense to us. And no yes. one would be like, he's undeveloped, he's flat, and whatever. But because he's a dude, they're like, why, you know. What? Why can't he? Yeah, he's flat, and what, you know. And so I was like, <laughs> and it was interesting because like, a black male feminist like wrote this critique. Um, it was clear to me that he hadn't read Mark. 
Um, and also, you know, I was like, what kind of black male feminism are you on if what it unsettles you when you see a black man sort of unapologetically supporting this sister, mm-hmm. right, to right. do her profession well, right. and where we keep relegating that kind of support work to, uh, you know, a black woman of a certain type. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and, and then with Edison, I mean, you know, she, for, I think that she was declaring the, so, um, declaring the death of that Cosby thing. I mean, he looked she like who? Cosby. Uh, Olivia, when she was like, I don't want him, he looked a bit like Cosby. So, what the representational read, not necessarily the intention behind the show, is that it says we don't, we're not going to do that Cosby thing. But what was interesting was his feeling of entitlement to it, right? Like, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Which, which sometimes happens with professional black dudes where they step to straight black women and they're like, well, I got a job, though. I got a job and I got power and I'm educated and so why wouldn't you? Want me because you're boring, because you're boring. <laughs> and so uh, I'm just so I, what I'm trying, but what I'm suggesting though is so yes, they have a space. Here's the thing Shonda doesn't get credit for though, which is that everyone says there's the critique about how she doesn't talk about race, but she's created a world in which a black man runs shit. Mm-hmm. Right, the, the the sort of core of the universe, power lies in Rowan or whatever Eli Rowan, whatever his name is, Papa Pope. Mm-hmm. And so she is. I mean, so in Wonderland, yeah. right? Black people run things. They pull the strings. All of this sort of, you know, a black woman is worthy of of a powerful white men fighting over her stead. And I'm not saying we have to like those things, but I'm saying sometimes I wonder how we uh, how we conclude that there is no racial vision behind these shows mm-hmm. when she has given us a totally flipped moral universe in which this is what it potentially would look like if black folks embodied state power and really ran things and could make white people do what they wanted them to do. Yeah. <laughs> I like this notion of, of race mattering, but maybe not in the way that we are able to um, interrogate it yet. We need to to make the leap that Shonda Rhimes has made right. in terms of how power plays out right. when race doesn't announce itself. I do remember last night um, in her dream sequence when she said twice as uh, twice, twice, as twice as good, twice as good, and that resonates in an old uh, way in terms of black families. You know, you have to be twice as good in order to. Um, I want to invite you all to. Um, enter this conversation as you can. Um, And we don't have to remember that legal frame. It's an interesting one for us, but there is a booty that's out there too that we haven't talked about. Um, Who makes and unmakes these characters and what authorities they have. I see a question here, yes. Yes. I love the panel that I want to pay for Miranda's booty. Because it was an unusual moment for us to have her um, make a transition around issues of domestic issues, right? So she got divorced because her husband could not support her. And then she got the young Yes. brother, Very right? Well. And he wants to always come and just make a little to them. You know, yeah. <laughs> people, that's just a good job. Can't believe I'm to come with me with her. I mean, it's just, <laughs> right? That's just a good job. <laughs> so it's nice to get talk about a, a, a case for her as a physical object of desire. Mm-hmm. And remember, it was her big JJ we first mm-hmm. saw, mm-hmm. right? Don't try to land, but we didn't see it. Well, he imagined it, right? Right. Like, <laughs> she had something for her child. I mean, right. she sexualized the black woman's body that was not supposed to be sexualized mm-hmm. right? before she got to, you know, to live and then. So I just wanted mm-hmm. to think she about, did, about what, 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 how she figures in this universe. Yeah. Um, and in terms of respectability, she's known as the Nazi in verse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, black woman Nazi, right? Mm-hmm. You know, what do we do with that? Um, but I want to you know, stay with her sexual, sexually. I mean, just as a, you know, it's particularly a thing. She was always so be quiet. I'll tell you about that. You know, but it's going on, right? And yeah. with him. Mm-hmm. Does that say it's fine? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, I mean, it's amazing to have like a little thickum, yes. short yes. black woman who looks very regular, and yes. and then thickum, thick, <laughs> thickum sex and thickum getting it in. And she, and at first, she doesn't even really believe, you know, him. She doesn't trust right. him because she's like, I'm just a little thickum. Like, what are you, <laughs> you're fine. If you, and, but he's like, no. And and so his doubling down and his commitment is, is interesting to sort of see and, and watch her enjoy, but to be hesitant about and to be really yeah. smart about and not to just sort of jump into it. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't mean to un, under. To develop her because she is my little friend. She's had three, <laughs> three fine black. Yeah. Yeah. She gets, they just trip over themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That nerve. <laughs> well, everyone in the whole hospital is fine, so <laughs> I, I, 
what else would be I need, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there's an audience out there somewhere outside of us is trying to hear our <laughs> um, we're having fun folks but we want you to too so question <laughs> That's her job. Yeah. That's what Sean does. That was a black woman allowed to say, I am tired. I need support. You know, Dr. Gray, and a few times I've watched it, she seems like she's kind of a mess. <laughs> but she's a surgeon, so she's powerful, and she's raising children. She has this gorgeous husband that loves her. And, you know, she's telling the nanny all these things that she needs and really realizing, you know, oh my God. Like, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and she calls her husband, and he's like, we made this commitment, like, we're gonna do this. Mm -hmm. But Olivia is always saying, I don't need help, or Abby's telling her, you have to be the gladiator, mm -hmm. or, and even in our shows where there were healthy relationships, like in the sitcoms, like James in Florida <coughs> or Cosby, they're, they seem more like equals, but not necessarily like one was more powerful than the other, Maybe, I don't know, to me, like, you still don't see us breaking down <coughs> Dr. Gray and saying, you know, that we need that. And, you know, is that problematic? Like, I, I struggle with it. I'm a social worker. And so I struggle with it with my patients because I'm like, you need help. You've been mm -hmm. raped during domestic mm -hmm. violence and how they are determined to say, I can take care of myself. Like, I can't be weak. I have to be strong. Mm -hmm. And it impedes me being able to help them. Um, I see it with myself. I mean, you know, like yeah. just mm -hmm. it's just an interesting thing to me. And well, who got to articulate that help yeah. narrative? Well, mm -hmm. and, and last is. night uh, it was it was it was Jesse Williams also, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, who got to have this moment of extraordinary vulnerability and expression and interiority. Um, and so, I, so I, I just take I take your point as a way of sort of re reading that episode um, in ways that I have Or haven't. even legally, like mm -hmm. with the state. Like, black women and women of color do not want the police coming to their house mm -hmm. and intervening well, in their relationships. Yeah. They want the violence to stop, but they do not want to utilize mm -hmm. um, One thing I read the, legally the last mm -hmm. night in that episode about the mother who had um, hurt her yes. children. Yeah. Um, we know there was a medical reason, but I think I tweeted something like, bring it before a court of law, and that medical reason was just go, um, you know, be dumped for here's a woman who hurt her children. So the difference between what our socialities allow us to feel, I mm -hmm. think, is a part of what, what she did with that moment was allow that, that um, empathetic sociality mm -hmm. to And it is that same adrenaline that, of the excitement that is also the adrenaline of, like, I can fight this. I will fight the bear. Mm -hmm. and, and always fighting the bear is, is, is killing us, too. Yeah. Both yeah. those things yeah. kill us. And, 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 you know, telling, I mean, because black women love to be strong and they, they, they will mark it in themselves and say, I am strong. And so they're looking at the world and saying, these people are not as strong as I am. And, and we're seeing that as a source of pride, but it, it's also the other hand that we, we cannot say, I am weak. I really can't do that because then who do you turn to? And right. what apparatus- Which is what the Gina Davis character is saying. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. And, and, you know, exactly who can fix me and who can help me and who can really be present in my life. And, and so, you know, M Meredith Gray is turning to this woman because she's wealthy. And so she can sort of grip onto somebody and say, I'll pay you a fortune if you can just sort of be like da 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 Most black women don't have the resources mm -hmm. to say, you know, please come like cook my dinner, do my laundry, be, be my friend, help me out, you know, make sense for my kids. And understand and so, that I'm right all along. Yeah, and, and so, that, that's so that's such a resourced kind of, of, of lifestyle. And so most black women don't know if you turn to your friends, they, they are in the same kinds of circumstances. So you don't even want to burden them with it. So, it, it you know, we don't we don't think about those things out loud, but I think Miranda, as a character, has sort of done those things. She sort of tried to be strong and then completely failed, mm -hmm. and and then we've had the chance mm -hmm. to sort of see her process her needs. So she's go, it's going to look different than Meredith. Like she's mm -hmm. not going to be crying to strangers, 
but she she <laughs> will. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Which yeah. is a good principle. Um, but <laughs> but she is going to ask for help. Eventually, she will she will hit her wall and she will need help. And so we have had a chance to see that character in that eighteen thousand year long show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I just want to um, bring in uh, the church for a minute because hmm. I think that a lot of what Black women struggle with is this idea that. You know, especially if you grow up in the church, as I did, mm -hmm. that, you know, the respectable, when you think about respectability and even Ill illegality, is that if you are a good Christian woman, then you are going to find a good Christian man who's going to protect you and take care of you. And so you get into a monogamous marriage and everything is going to sort of fall into place. Mm -hmm. But if you don't find that, then the sort of the unspoken um, implication right. is that there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. There's something that you're not doing right. Mm -hmm. gotcha. There's something that you, you know, there's some way that you, you know, you're not living right. Mm -hmm. And so you need to kind of buck up and, and do what you need to because you're not going to have the man take care of you. You're not, that, like that's, mm -hmm. that's out of your reach. And I think that we are there's a whole population of us who are constantly struggling with this idea of if I haven't found a husband, then you know I'm out there, and so I better get myself together and take and be strong and and do what I need to do for myself. But I mean, the interesting thing about the text of a church, I, I think there are multiple texts in church, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be you know there's literally the text, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the text for the day. Uh, there's the, the preacher and, the, and sort of the male leadership in that space, but there's also the women's leadership, right, which is mm -hmm. formal and informal. Mm -hmm. And and for me, in a, in a, as a member of a traditional black church, the mo sometimes the most important texts are the women in that space to me and the way that they live their lives and the way that they hold each other up, that it is a space where you can just cry and lay down on the floor and someone will come pat you and bring you a tissue and some water and hold you up and then they'll help you figure out what to do with your kids but that week. But they will also label you Jezebel. No, no, no. I mean, I think, I think there's a, there. I think there's a, there, there are churches there, there, where that will happen and then there are churches where everybody in there would be the dang Jezebel <laughs> if it went back far enough. And so they don't, they don't do that. Can I, can I jump in as a bad Christian? Uh, <laughs> and say fuck that. Um, and, um, <laughs> As a preacher's kid, a Baptist preacher's kid, who still goes to church, I think they will hold you up when it looks like your struggle is a holy struggle. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. My experience of being in church all my life is that they ain't trying to hold you up when you there because you got five babies by four different dudes, right. and you you know. But if if you shouting and you falling out because it looks like you trying to get right with God, Go ahead, then baby. they will hold you up. That's right. But yeah. any other time they are. And please know that I have had every type of run in with black women in church that you can imagine. Um, and. Um, <laughs> I blame you! I blame you for this. I, but, but, so, so that thing I was saying earlier, so it's not, I love the, I love the black church. Yeah. I also, but I, but. It's challenging because Absolutely. I understand because of that thing, right? So, so um, there was a story about a black woman who married herself going around yeah. last week, and I and so the second version of the story that came out, this dude was like, if she wanted to get married, she should have figured out what was wrong with it, and then she could have been married, right? And so that thing about wanting to be chose, that's the reason I said it because so much of our desire in a hetero patriarchy is constructed around wanting to be chose and then you go to church and you hear that you haven't been chose because either God is still working on you so there's some other shit that you just so white women getting chose Asian women getting chose but we'll let the church tell us that black women are so uniquely pathological that God can't give us nobody but so, 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 so back to it. So we 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 are accept the, the the fallibility of every institution as black intellectuals, 
except for the fallibility of the church. No, here's the, the church, thing. The no, church is that's our... Not, that's not my critique. No, but, but, I mean, I, but, the church, but here's the thing, though, Blair. If you could church, let me finish. But the church <laughs> won't let us have this conversation, right? I, because I tried to have this conversation in my church with the women that I did ministry work with mm -hmm. as a Baptist, as a committed Baptist person, which is like the worst denomination you can be that's when right. you want to have a progressive gender politics, <laughs> right? Um, and, and they weren't trying to have the sociological analysis piece be allowed when we are talking about how do we struggle together with God around how we think about ourselves. I try to introduce that and I've tried to do it in multiple spaces. And until my most current church, by and large, they don't the frame they don't allow the framework to be enlarged enough. So, well, but, but then you then you just said something. Until my most current church. Which has a radical black feminist pastor who's a PhD. So, okay. so that's a church. So that's a church. I'm sorry, but, that's not, that's, but most churches but most churches don't have most churches don't have PhDs for ministers. Most churches that black women go to don't even have women for ministers. Right. But, but there's, right. a way, there's a way in which we say that then that's not a church. You basically, no, no, I think that is but a church. That is a that's church. The church I and so, the church so I, I think we in. need to demand of churches that they be our church, that they be the church that we need. That okay, they be the church I'm that going to take are a, a moderator. And not just say that the church is here. here. Right? And, and, and that's there's a moderator. I'm trying to say that there's a moderator. Like all that stuff onto the show, though. So we, so, so our narrative about morality, to loop it back. So our narrative about morality and a lot of the early critiques of scandal, a lot of the conversation. Um, because, because here's the thing: the respectability conversation we're having. Having. Part of the reason we're never honest about that conversation, Carla, <laughs> is because because respectability is deeply tied to this right wing turn in Christian Absolutely. theology too That's that right. lots of black communities uh, adhere to. We don't in our set. We have a critique, right? Even if we're in the church, we have a critique, a narrative, and some language. But a lot of folks haven't even ever heard the term politics of respectability, so they don't always recognize how what we call good, just conservative Christian theology is actually a lot of the tenets of a politics of respectability that has a specific moment in history that it comes about, and it has particular political uses. So what happens is those women elevate what is political to the level of theological, and then they can't get out of it. So when they watch shows like this, they can't even embrace the pleasure that they feel because they feel like it's some commentary that's on their right. moral being. Right? Okay, all right, so, so I'm, I'm glad. And I'm gonna let you finish. Um, <laughs> when Mark has a panel on black Christianity, but I want to loop our other panelists in here and also the questions from the audience. And you've been, let, let's listen to each other, please. I'm kind of nervous because mine does have to do with the church. Okay, then. No, uh, no. I'm just, <laughs> In, in maybe earlier scene, earlier years, you saw Miranda have a relationship with the church, mm. but by and large, you don't you don't see that at all mm -hmm. with Olivia mm -hmm. and with Annalise. Yet they have such access to power through their performance, and so it it for me begins to question in this post moral society where of Shonda Lynn, where black women have perform church but have no access to power within the church, is there a way that Shonda Land can help us reimagine spaces for, um, or reimagine a relationship with um, black women and spirituality or religiosity that does not primarily have a place mm -hmm. in the church? I'm gonna ask mm -hmm. um, if Jessica or Martha have a response to that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm listening. Uh, oh, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening. Um, and I have a couple of reflections uh, that that may not go all the way to your question, mm -hmm. but I, I was asking myself what Olivia and Annalise um, do on Sunday, right? You know, you know, and I, I had never asked myself that, you know, literally or metaphorically, sort of where they are and what they do. And I, I think my answer, reflecting, is they work, right? And, and so, I, I, so I'm trying to think about the relationship between. Um, those two spheres uh, uh, of, um, of, of uh, knowledge, of, of understanding, of making sense of the world and what's lost, right, when, um, when work becomes the sphere, right, through which we make sense of the world, through which we interpret the world, 
Um, and that, it does, so that's just a point of reflection, right? It's an observation, but I think it's not one that's irrelevant to us mm -hmm. um, in the ways we understand our lives can, in fact, become organized and reorganized around um, a, a, an idea of work or an idea of vocation, an idea of demand, um, where I, I spend time with you all, um, you know, um, literally and figuratively, and I know I know how many hours you work. Right. I, I know. I know that on Sunday you're doing many things, but you're on. Right. Um, and so, I, so I think there's a there's at least a, a point of reflection there for us. Mm -hmm. I think that it, to go along with that also, I mean, as you guys were speaking, I was thinking, did, did, did John and I, do people even go to church? Like, I mean, yeah, we have no, the one character, no, no, no. Um, the, like, the one in Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we don't have a narrative of people's spiritual lives. We have people who are very have, mm -hmm. are expressing ideas of morality mm -hmm. in the right. post-war world. Right. But not necessarily expressing them in relationship to a, a heavenly being or a, a right. supreme right. being, whatever they may be. Right. And I think that that's really important to kind of keep in mind, especially as we're approaching um, the show, this relationship between um, a kind of Protestant, Afro-Protestant black church in the U.S. with blackness and that these mm -hmm. things um, often are tied together in very specific ways, but black people diasporically can approach the show from a whole host of directions, whether mm -hmm. they are, whether the church is an important part of their lives or not. And I think that there's something, there's something to that. It can be good or bad or post war, whatever it may be. But I think that it's, it is a, it is a careful thing to approach the show with black women view the show like this when black women are diasporically so diverse even in watching the show and have very diverse relationships, even if they are U.S. African Americans, to the church also. Um, that we were using yeah. the church as sort of a marker of what blackness and what black womanhood means, and that may not be, that may, that is important, but we shouldn't make it distinct from everybody who is coming right. to and approaching the show, because right. anybody can approach Olivia. I read Olivia in a Caribbean lens. Like, she's mm. beat to the nines. Like, there's something about that performance of, um, of, of there's an extra femininity to her mm -hmm. that you can approach it whether it's heteronormative you can approach it whether you're in the U.S. whether you're in the Caribbean like mm -hmm. there are all these aspects to her that are really really mm -hmm. based in a whole series of black female tropes mm -hmm. um, right. that I don't know that we I think we lose when we begin to view black womanhood and how Shonda is portraying it only through a particular well, church narrative. No, one way right. to, to think about it is that it is a text that's deliberately evaded in the way that mm -hmm. she has mm -hmm. placed yeah. Um, however, the regulatory environment here is, it's about law, it's not about the law of religion. So she certainly centered that with How to Get Away with Murder and, um, what's the show, and Scandal. <laughs> um, so it's all about legality in that very particular state-centered, state-produced way. Um, question back here? I had a question um, regarding Millie. Mm. Mm. Olivia <laughs> <laughs> I find it to be the most interesting. You all spoke about the layers. Yeah. And at first, you know, very often, you know, when there's an affair and we like the affair, we can uh, justify it by saying, well, the wife knows and she sucks anyway, so it's all good. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. And then. as we got to know Millie, I actually like her. Mm -hmm. I think she's very That's interesting. Awesome. But as we got to know her, as she unpacked, as Shonda unpacked, who she is and where she comes from and what she believes and then this relationship that she has with Olivia because what Millie wants is power mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. and if she has to love, you know bring this woman in who makes her husband happy which will keep her in power I can do that and so I find that relationship the interplay between Millie the president Shonda Excuse me, not Shonda, but Olivia Pope. <laughs> but all of just the way that they have interwoven this relationship, to me, is, is really fascinating. Yeah, I really find Millie profound because when we could encounter her, we encounter sort of the Republican white woman, and we, that we were happy to put her in that little Absolutely. little spot. But then when we meet her. And then when she's suffering and she's mourning yeah, the last one, I found that really profound and important um, to sort of to, to honor that, that she she had sacrificed yes. to be in that relationship, that she does love him. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a good relationship with him. She's not healthy and he's not healthy, <laughs> but she actually loves her husband so much so that she's like, well, you know, for us to, to do that, to navigate this world, because her power is really also about um, 
sort of honoring the struggle that she put into the marriage, right? right. And so she wants something to result from it, both for him and for her. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really interesting to sort of see, um, unpack sort of the, the person that we're supposed to hate mm -hmm. and that we're supposed to just want to get off the stage. Mm -hmm. we, we can't be comfortable with the, where is that, Vermont or wherever she's going to be making jam. It looks very dull to me. Uh, but, 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 but we, we, don't, we don't want her shoved off. We really don't want her erased. And we, we want her to, to find something, too. And so I, I, I like the complexity that she's been able to find in the character that we, the audience normally wouldn't be very sympathetic to. The writers have also given her a way, us a way to understand it and bringing in the elderly ex-president's wife, former president's right. wife, yeah. to yeah. instruct yeah. her yeah. how to use her power. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. seeing that relationship evolve, then we get a backstory about this is how power is art, both articulated and taught. Yes, question? So one of the biggest complaints I get when I'm on Facebook um, is Come that over to Twitter. These, mm. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Come on here. Is that these shows tell too much of our business. That's mm. the biggest yeah. number one like, thing I get. And, mm. and then when I talk to my mother and her friends, they say, oh, that's just too much. And her taking off her makeup and why she going to look like that? And take off her hair. What is that? Mm. And so I thought it was interesting in thinking about that and then thinking about what happened First Lady this last week um, in Saudi Arabia, and this whole thing about her being this feminist model, when I kind of got the impression that she was like, what? Like, she didn't, that wasn't her intention of being this feminist model, and, and that we're putting, and that they keep putting this thing on her, like, she gotta be a fighter, she has to be this, and it's sometimes like, oh no, she's not this, and so I'm kind of wondering in, there's, you know, there's these four women who are in the White House right now, these four black women who are in the White House, and they're constantly put in these positions where they have to perform in the same way that kind of that um, Olivia and Elise have to perform. And I kind of wanted to hear what your ideas were about that, if, if that's what you see, or, um, and, what, and what kind of feedback, if you even think that way, maybe I'm off place, but what do you think? Well, I think it's important to say there's two, two girls and two women. Oh, I thought you were talking about Valerie Jarrett. <laughs> oh, you're talking about Valerie Jarrett? <laughs> <laughs> There's a ton of women in the White House. I just, my child just turned 13, and so I'm getting this information from Valerie Jarrett. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling this, and so I'm, I'm wondering as, you know, the stuff that came out Woman with um, Sasha and Lee a couple months ago, right. this woman talking about. Yeah, well, that, to me, that's why we assert that they are girls, right? right that right, they are not, right. need, that the society need not frame them as women right. as much as they might think they are women in their heads. That's their job right, as right. teenagers. <laughs> but, but we need to remember that they're girls. Right. And we would remember if they were in different bodies that right. they were girls right. and not deserving of that kind of judgment. But I, I do think, you know, and I'd love to hear from everybody else and shut up sometime. But um, that, that Michelle is very much engaged in the sort of Olivia Pope performance. Because if we remember old Michelle before Michelle was First Lady Michelle and before she was running for her office Michelle, she wasn't that snatched. Like she was a working woman, she had some suits and it was, you know, just regular clothes and she wears snatch back all the time. And she was just a regular, beautiful, everyday person. But she, she on the campaign and in the White House, she's making very important choices about who she wears and what she wears, that some of it's high end and some of it's from Target. And some, of, you know, and she, she's making very strategic political choices about the, the way that she presents herself in the world. So I don't think there's probably any accident. I doubt she just didn't think about Saudi Arabia and covering her head. Pretty sure she just was like, oh, well, I'm gonna walk outside now. And that's the decision I made about what I'm gonna do in that space. And I, and I bet she was interested in, in inserting that in that moment. So. She's very political in presentation of her girls and of herself, and she's been done a good job of mostly keeping her mama away from mm -hmm. all of that. her as one of the women. Yeah, yeah. But Martha, so, Jessica, Brittany. Yeah, so uh, for me, um, the, the moment um, to reflect upon your question, Erica, comes um, very early in the administration. You'll remember when Michelle Obama, um, when they release her official photographic portrait and she's not wearing sleeves. Mm -hmm. um, and if we understand that to be a profoundly intentional moment, mm -hmm. 
um, it, it, it links, I think, to our conversation about scandal in the sense, uh, so, so are we in a moment when, um, I don't know, a, a cultural dissemblance of politics of respectability is being at least displaced or complicated mm -hmm. by um, what clearly is a politics of pleasure, right? You know, it is um, for all the um, for all the cheap shots that people take at um, Michelle Obama's arms. Um, don't beautiful. we know that she? <laughs> that, that it's absolutely pleasure, right? It's absolutely pleasure, right? To to take off the cardigan, right, and, and to be that, right? That you can't help but read that image, um, in part through that way, um, and so, um, so is is Shonda um, sort of um, reflecting that? Is Shonda generating that? I, I'm, I'm sure both are true, mm -hmm. um, but they seem deeply in conversation, mm -hmm. at least to me. Yeah. Um, Two things. One is this conversation reminds me of, about the ongoing debate about where do we see feminist politics, right? Because mm -hmm. so part of the conversation about mm -hmm. Michelle this week was was this a feminist move? Mm -hmm. And then I saw people being, you know, so I saw all the think pieces, right? So some were like, <laughs> no, it's feminist, and then others mm -hmm. were like, she's still supporting imperial state power, and the and I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> so I never know what to do with black woman in that. Right? I'm just always like, other than Condoleezza Rice. If your husband becomes the president, what you supposed to do? Be like, I'm anti-status. Like, that's, just don't know how that's going to work out. So, um, so I never quite know what to do with, with that particular strand of radical feminist critique about Michelle Obama's possibility. Because, I mean, that's the radical feminist stuff. And then the liberal feminists are all on the, well, she's on the mommy track now, you know, so she's the mom in chief, and so she's not feminist for that. So it's always the narrative about how can we disqualify her from yeah. accessing mm -hmm. politics, right. which means that they don't ever have to acknowledge all the battle that it takes to just do that, right? To just step yes. out and be mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in the most fabulous of ways. Um, and then, so then we apply that critique to scandal. So there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, is scandal feminist? And you know, in the first couple of seasons, it wasn't particularly feminist in the sense that Olivia Pope was always throwing white women under the bus to protect the president. It didn't matter what happened to him. <laughs> and I would be tweeting Treva and the ninjas, the pleasure ninjas, who are two with on um, Thursday nights and saying to them, um, you know, scandal is no country for white women because it really didn't feel <laughs> like it was. And then in the last couple seasons, you've seen a shift, yeah. right? So yeah. she's become, there's been far more moments of like forthright feminist yeah. advocacy from the characters and then in terms of the cases that yeah. she takes on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's interesting in that way. I don't know that we can pin it down, but I just always wonder, I mean, part of it is it, is it represents the kind of tension that black women always exist in in relationship to feminist politics, which is to say mm -hmm. that we could be doing something radically embodied, which is itself politically important, um, even when, but it doesn't always work in terms of calling it feminist or not feminist or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we had that problem from Beyonce to Michelle. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm so happy to be in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so th just a, a, a quick question and, and a short comment. Thank you for bringing out the notion of that, the diaspora and the heterogeneity in black women's spiritual practices because mm -hmm. I think it's problematic to, to frame all black women who engage with the show as black Christian when we know that that can't possibly be true. Um, so the, the thing I wanted to say is that in this discussion about the state and how the state factors into Shondaland, can we talk about marriage and, and uh, the side pieces? That's the only thing like I haven't heard you guys talk about. So I mean, how is marriage as a, a kind of heteronormative state structure treated in uh, Shondaland, like across those shows? You know, um, over the lunch, I was talking with um, Don Solomon, who was here this morning from the National Humanities Center, um, and um, linking um, the representations of marriage, the engagements of marriage to debates about marriage equality. And, and we at least were breathing sort of extraordinary sigh of relief, right? Which is to say, um, Shonda gives us, mar you know, gives us good old fashioned marriage, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, doesn't give us, you know, straight jacketed, you know, for, you know, public consumption, mm -hmm. for political um, objectives marriage, right? She gives us marriage, right, that is messy um, <laughs> and, and complex and uneven. Um, and uh, and I have to say, uh, we were saying, you know, and thank goodness, right? Who was going to bring back, who was going to ask those questions, right, mm -hmm. about marriage in an era when um, both 
queer and straight people that across the spectrum, right, we're all straight jacketed, right, by a debate, an important political mm -hmm. campaign and debate, mm -hmm. right, that has recrafted marriage mm -hmm. into, um, you know, a picket fence and, and two and a half children and all of those things. And she is sort of opening us, you know, sort of marriage um, that endures, marriage that is messy, all those things. And, and it's, it's a breathing space, I think, for, for, for thinking mm -hmm. about marriage and what it is and how it works and what it might be, um, what it means. And she always makes marriage like fundamentally unrealistic, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. in, in the glossy kind of way. Mm -hmm. Because when we do go to Vermont and we mm -hmm. imagine it, it looks <laughs> ridiculous. Like no one's <laughs> married like that. <laughs> and so she, she holds it out like, you know, this is what she's supposed to desire, but doesn't this look stupid? This doesn't even look like Olivia. The dog had a white strap. Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> yeah. know, everything's big and glossy <laughs> and shiny and everyone's very happy. And yeah. so she's basically saying, you know, let's throw out that imagined thing and, and, and see marriages for what they are, both in their construction, their destruction, their, their complication, their the infidelity, the, all of the, the, the messy. She, she, she does it to gay marriage. They don't have a mm. good, happy, you know, like, we've gotten here, and now we're going to have good, good gay marriage. No, you want to kill, evidently you want to assassinate your husband. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so you know, it, it's all complicated. And I, that, I heard you guys were using the word messy to talk about it messy morning. is working. It's definitely here. messy. In the gray? Oh, um, no, I was just going to say uh, with the marriage thing, one thing um, I've noticed like, within uh, the black community, especially if women, is, and w one thing I do like with Shonda, you know, or, okay, so, you know, I've been told throughout my life, and I've heard this before, you have to get married, you have to find a man, and you'll be happy. You can't be a single woman with a child and not be happy, or you're going to be on welfare. Or you're going to stuff like that and with and everything is going to be rainbows and sunshine in marriage especially with the black woman that's not the case I mean, mm. um, and I think one thing I do like about Scandal is Olivia Polk is this woman she's successful um, and she's not married nor she's looking for marriage she's successful her standing and how she is and with um, how to get away with murder she I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. I know what happened to the husband right now because I'm behind. But don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, it's messy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Real messy. Yeah. Literally. 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 Mostly it's just much more regular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, it's broader than that. Did you so Maybe we can't. Like did you have no? Like yeah. Takes, There's no young age. Raw reality is that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I don't think any show has done ever. I think raw is a really good word. It's sort of equal opportunity. This, um, dysfunction. Dysfunction, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I wonder Jessica. about the ways, um, the question of marriage is really interesting, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I wonder about the ways that marriage. What about the ways that that? So in Shondaland, do we see there's marriage as sort of the partnership and and the romance and the building a life together and, and all those aspects that you know sort of for in Shondaland seem to happen outside of the boundaries of state power potentially. So like Gray, um, Gray and um, Derek get married on a post-it and they don't mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. get married married until they oh, have yeah. to adopt um, mm -hmm. uh, adopt the, the, the young girl. Um, so I'm wondering, and I'm just sort of processing it now, thinking about the ways that, what are the moments in Shondaland that you actually do see the state intervening and interceding in your intimate and domestic life? Like mm -hmm. that was one moment where they had to get married because the state said you cannot have this child that you have created kinship with mm -hmm. unless you, you know, follow these rules that we have given you. Mm -hmm. um, and we have um, Callie in Arizona who get married um, and it's not, it, I don't think it's ever really clear if it is le within legal boundaries of where they are in um, mm -hmm. Seattle. So like there's, so, but uh, we don't see that that often. Like we don't see the custody battles. We don't see, you know, the battles over property and exchange of property. We don't see necessarily issues of insurance and taxes and all the things that come with the state management mm -hmm. of these relationships. And I, I'm just re sort of realizing that now and thinking about what is there to that and is there something that 
works for us and that we don't then have to see that. We don't have to deal with those aspects of marriage. We can enjoy the parts of it. And that's provocative. Like Natalie was saying, this is maybe uh, may the first polyamorous black figure we've seen. Yeah. Like that's extremely important to imagine relationships that are long-term, that are consensual, that are lasting outside the boundaries of marriages. But where do we see the, the kind of violences that also can occur or the, the breaks where you have to write something down and what does that mean? That, especially in a legal The thing that, that, that comes here. to me is the language you're using around custody and property we've mm -hmm. talked about in terms of I choose me. Um, I'm going to own me. I'm going to make... Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if they shift from that, that terrain of family, however we want to make our families cohere to the terrain of the individual. Um, and is the individual the black woman who, met, who is able then, maybe this is where the, the state-centered argument takes place, who is then able to take up those rights in her own body, um, or at least have a space of arguing can, them. There was I, a question in the back. Can I jump in? Oh, sure. Yeah. One thing that I want to say, too, you know, there's like a, I don't know if this book is out yet, but this guy, white sociologist, is writing this book about how, you know, more and more Americans are single or remaining unmarried, and so we're, you know, in the next couple decades going to be a country where the majority of adults are unmarried, not married. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that, though, is that this is this thing where we don't always give black women credit for the ways that we, the ways of living that we pioneer, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so we are That's sort of at the forefront of imagining um, what black singlehood looks like and how to do that in a generative way. And so we're still in a moment where that's pathologized because it doesn't meet particular norms, but it is the way that the country itself is moving. And so what would happen if we thought of these shows as, um, as in the way that they problematize marriage and in the way that they show us the sort of under dark underbelly of marriages, um, also opening up this broader conversation on the backs of black women, right? But maybe mm -hmm. also with them having some subjectivity and agency to think about how we have full lives, right, um, as unmarried people. And that's important because I think a lot of the black feminist um, pleasure work um, works in part because most of the folks who do it are unpartnered people, right, um, who are thinking about who now have to think about how do I build a life if I don't have a partner that I can rely I don't have a ready go to support system. Mm -hmm. I don't have ready go to economic backup plan, mm -hmm. right? I mean, assuming that your partner can be that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so then it requires a level of intention about how do you build a community of support if you want to have children, how do you parent them, and what kind of model do you do that in? How can you be economically self sustaining when in a world where black women still make so much less than almost every other demographic group, save Latinas, um, and then you, you know, but you, but you have to live, and so you don't have, so you don't have any of the safety nets. So I think that we're, so all I'm, so, so the, sh the short point is, perhaps um, Shonda Land is participating in a broader social theorization of how to be sing mm -hmm. of, of singlehood that Black women are actively doing in terms of practice and theorizing, therefore. Um, and not getting credit for it. And so what would it mean to think about it as that yeah. kind of project? Mm -hmm. Let me suggest, I think I want to turn this back to Mark. I was going to say we had room for one more question, but we're really close to two. That another thing that is inventing here that we can certainly take note of is the way in which Brittany, Jessica, Martha, and, and Blair, and the earlier panel, Joan, Shreva, um, Lisa, and Natalie, recreate what might be an academic conversation mm -hmm. so that you hear substance rather than a paper. You hear us responding back and forth to each other rather than something that I prepared two weeks ago and was working on the airplane to fix. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we might do as black women academics, um, especially in the ways in which we enjoy our virtual conversations with each other, is to replicate the conversations in this kind of panel. And I want to thank Mark for doing this. So closing comments for us? I, I, I think Laurent and I both are pretty amazed. We knew what the content was going to be. Um, we knew putting these women, these voices, these intellects together was going to produce what it produced. Um, but the fact that it did, in fact, reach audiences that we wanted to do forum for scholars and public. We all do the scholars piece really well. <laughs> we all do the public piece for ourselves very well. <laughs> very rarely do we actually get publics in here. So the fact that they're Duke students and Central students, we had a wide range of, of Triangle community folks that were at the screening last night. That means we're doing the kind of work that we 
really wanted to do. And the fact that black women's voices were at the forefront of this conversation yeah. makes it even that much more important. So thank you all for coming out and supporting. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you.